ancient biblical prophets wrote about the future. Today, theologians are poring over those scriptures with a firm belief that their prophecies are coming to pass. Journey now into the world of eschatology on Prophecy in the News with author and lecturer J.R. Church. In the November edition of our magazine, Prophecy in the News, on page 5, we have an ad for an incredible book called Nephilim Stargates. We have the author with us today, Dr. Thomas Horn. This is the book. Here's the man. Gary Stearman is here. We're going to have a roundtable discussion on the Nephilim and how they get to planet Earth and what's going on today with UFOs, transgenics, Gary has the first question. Well, Jr., it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Thomas Horn to our TV viewing audience. And, and let me tell you, this is going to be a great discussion. Hang on every word. Thomas Horn, welcome to Prophecy in the News. Well, thank you for having me on your program, Jr. Uh, and okay. I've got a million questions. I've read the book. It's a fascinating read, and it links a lot of prophetic ideas together that maybe haven't been linked this way before. What's this book about, Tom? Well, I'll tell you what truly motivated me in this was I, and we can talk about this if you want to, I started doing some research into some emerging fields of science, transgenics, biotechnology, um, but I actually was looking for scientific models mm -hmm. that might tell us where this technology would lead us. The blending of humans and animals the create the creating of modern chimeras yes you know what might the from a scientific point of view what might the benefits to humanity be interrupting a chimera uh, the the idea of linking uh, two different animals together into a single unit such as the old gods of egypt uh, a man's body and the head of a jackal a right. chimera well uh, the scientific community is proud of this mouth with a human ear growing on its back you know <laughs> yes. we can make human ears and put ears back on people this is this is basically what we're talking about, isn't it? Transgenic. Well, the, uh, y yes, certainly that was one of the early um, experiments that was being done. Now it's much more sophisticated than that. It's grown over the last ten years in phenomenal ways. Mm -hmm. But what I could not find were models because the the science was emerging so quickly. Uh, it's kind of like riding the bicycle while while you build it. I mean, they were they were doing the research before they even knew what the ramifications of it might be. Still are. Mm -hmm. uh, genetically modified crops are already showing us that they might impact the environment in ways we're not prepared for, but it's not stopping us or corporations from patenting seeds and, and putting out various kinds of, of crops. Some crops now that are part animal, crops that have mm -hmm. fish genetics yeah, in them and things tomatoes. like that. That's, now, that's, you're talking I'm opening Pandora's box here, aren't you? Well, potentially we are. And, this, and this is where it went back into history. Mm -hmm was that this Pandora's box had been opened once before because while I couldn't find models that would say where this may take us either positively or negatively we ran into this old story and we started finding it in cultures around the world about the gods who had come down and this was told in Greece, it was told in Samaria, uh, there's references to what we believe connects to this in the book of Genesis, there were also mm -hmm. other uh, extra-biblical or pseudepigrapha books, but some of which are referenced in the Bible, that told this story of these super intelligences who came down, but one of the things that they did, and it seemed that it, it, it was required of them to blend the DNA of different species for some purpose that seems to relate to allowing them to incarnate themselves. Uh, the story in Greece Zeus comes down, he marries a woman, or somehow he shares with her DNA, and Hercules, a mighty man of old, the, the story is told uh, that, that there was this need to blend between yes. humans and animals. Of course, in Genesis, the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took them wives of all which they would, and after that... So these stories from Greek mythology of a man <coughs> who's from the waist down is a horse, or of Pan, who was a man from the waist down, was a goat. This is the kind of thing you're talking about here. This, this was what I kept running into. That, and, and the story that was told, the moral story that was told, was this led to chaos. And it seemed in some cases to almost be like a crude record. 
In other words, people back then trying to illustrate what had happened. So maybe it's half goat, half man. But the deeper message is there was a blending, mm -hmm. a crossing over of the species. And as a Christian and as a former pastor, um, I had an interest in this because I've always believed that there was a divine order and that God spoke all creation and then breathed into the nostrils of Adam. He gave all these different creations the ability to procreate after themselves. But he ordered that each would recreate after its own kind. Mm. So that naturally, uh, a donkey cannot breed with a dog. Yes. But scientifically, we're doing it now. And it appeared to me when I started looking at this trail that, the, that ancient intelligences had done the same. Tom, the name of your book, Nephilim Stargates. Quickly, let's uh, define the title. Stargate, and maybe uh, you're thinking of the sci-fi program that's on TV. It's not quite that, but on the other hand, it's not that far away, is it? Well, uh, first of all, I have to admit that I tried to pick what I thought was a very popular, uh, well-known name mm -hmm. that uh, popular culture could identify with the idea mm -hmm. that you are creating an opening, a portal. A portal, a, a gate through which, what comes through the gate? Well, uh, even on television, it's aliens, and ah. so uh -huh. uh, I, I had an interest in that. I also think that there is, um, there's also a, um, a, a kind of spiritual way to look at this. Okay. That um, the, this ancient story in the Bible and Enoch and, and Jasher and other books was that there were these angels who did not want to remain in their plane of existence. And they saw the daughters of women. These daughters of women for them may have been the stargate, the method through which they left their plane of existence and came into our three-dimensional reality. Well, now Jude talks about the angels who left their first estate uh, and who are now held in chains of darkness because of that sin. Uh, their first estate, of course, would have been heaven. Right. They left that and they came to earth and they had to come, you're saying, through some sort of portal. Well, and, and this is why I think this is key. And actually, to me, this is what solved for me the mystery of the Watchers. Why did they do what they did? Why did they have to blend? Because if you read the whole story from Enoch and Jasher, which is referred to in the Bible, um, it, it, the, the sin that they committed against the women, they also committed against the animals and even against the plant life, so that eventually all life be all flesh became corrupted mm. on earth. And I've never thought that it's you know, a good exegesis to think that this corruption was talking about immorality because uh, a donkey might step on your toe, but we don't think of him as committing an immoral act. Yes. The corruption was something else, and it was the, it was the, the corruption of DNA. And yes. all, through intermarriage and interspecies breeding over a long period of time, de what God had created started becoming corrupted until the point that it, that, it, that it was entirely corrupt. In fact, the ancient book of Jasher says, uh, uh, in Jasher 4.18, it says, and after, after the fallen angels went into the daughters of men, then men began to teach the mixing of, of, of creatures of one species with another in order to provoke the Lord. Mm. And I, when I first found that text, I thought, well, it certainly would not have provoked the Lord if you were talking about hybridization. Read one animal, or read one horse with another horse. Right. It, it, you had to interpret it literally. They began teaching right after the fallen angels went into the daughters of men. They began teaching the blending of one species to another. Why would they have had to do that? That's the answer to the Stargate. Mm -hmm. Very good. J.R.? Well, I want you to get the book. We're talking about this book in particular, Nephilim Stargates, the year 2012 and the return of the Watchers. That's a neat subtitle. <laughs> I want you to get it. It's available through our ministry. Call the phone number at the bottom of your screen and order it today. It's 14.95 plus shipping and handling. Okay? I want you to get it. Tom Horn is here to t tell us about it, tell us what he's written, how he wrote it, but you just need to get it and read it for yourselves. You can see I've got all kinds of little sticky notes here in it, uh, prepared to talk about various subjects that are in this book. I've read the book. I heartily recommend it. You need to find out what happened when those sons of God saw the daughters of men in Genesis chapter 6 and how Jude talked about them then over near the book of Revelation and how in the book of Revelation chapter 12 there's a war in heaven and suddenly the devil and his angels are cast out of heaven to the earth. 
And then the statement, it says, Woe to you people on earth. The devil has come down to you knowing he hath but a short time. What's going to happen when the tribulation period gets here? Will there suddenly be an armada of UFOs around the world that will just blink in from another dimension and then can't blink back out again? They're stuck here? Can you imagine what would happen? to the world governments and how it, it could see the rise of an antichrist, uh, a messiah figure to save the world from these creatures. Well, you need to get the book, okay? Call the phone number at the bottom of your screen and order it. It's fourteen ninety five plus shipping and handling. Gary? Well, J.R., I'm fascinated. I've read the book, uh, and again, you have to read it. We'll talk about it today, but I guarantee you there's much more in this book than we have time to cover. Uh, Tom, if you were trying to, to uh, briefly uh, let people know what your thrust was, what your purpose was in writing this book, what was it exactly? Well, it was that I stumbled upon what I thought was an explanation for something that I had been curious about for a long time, and that was if the if the watchers wanted to come down in the days of Jerob on on Horeb, why didn't they just come down and mate with these women? What why did they have to tinker with the DNA of yes. both the women? Now, um, my, of course, my formal and orthodox education was that this was an attempt to cut off the bloodline of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And I still believe that that was true. Yes. But, but, what I, but what I became intrigued with was how could this lead to incarnation? Because that was also the story, that these were gods who walked among people. They saw them physically. Now, like today, uh, when we look at ufology, the best, uh, even the best secular writers in ufology, Jacques Vallée, Dr. John Keel, Dr. John Mack, all concluded that whatever was going on with alien abduction phenomenon was similar to biblical demonology and to the history of the watchers mm -hmm. because there is this need to collect to harvest dna of humans but not just humans you go to bed one night you wake up the next morning and skippy the horse is out in the field with portions of his face that have been removed with laser precision there's no footprints coming to him or from him no blood no blood and it's happened around the world thousands of times and no law enforcement agency yet has been able to capture the international blood-sucking cult that's doing this to these animals. Yes. Mm -hmm. But these are happening in UFO flap areas, so that there is a phenomenology that occurred not just in ancient times, but almost appears to also be happening now. So this intrigued me. The bottom line to answer this question about why I, I thought I had solved the answer, uh, the question of the watchers and why they had to do this mingling was the light came on one day that God had created all intelligent forms of life, all of it dated back to him. Mm -hmm. And he had kick-started it and then put up a barrier between the species in order that each kind reproduce after its own kind. So meaning then that at the moment that the sperm of a dog meets ovum of a dog and a, and a dog zygote is formed, at the earliest moment of life, the spirit of a dog enters that being. Uh, the same thing is true of a human, a horse, any other creature, all dating back to the creation of God. Well, according to Enoch, these watchers had participated with God in creation. They could not speak into existence like he could, but they knew something about mm -hmm. genetic manufacturing. Uh -huh. And they knew that in order to create a body for themselves to be incarnated in, they had to create something that God had not made. And that by breaching the species barrier, and this is why God had commanded the species barrier not to be broken, they had created something that was neither animal nor man. If it was part dog and part man, the spirit of a dog would not enter into it. It wasn't, it wasn't a dog. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a man, so the spirit of a man would not enter it. They had made a biological form into which they could incarnate themselves. And then they began procreating, which of course led to the great chaos of, of the Old Testament. So once I had my mind wrapped around this concept, that I'm trying to explain it in just a few words, because I know we have limited mm -hmm. time, uh, it really helped me with understanding how what we're doing today in biotechnology may also be opening a gateway now for the return of something that we haven't seen in thousands of years. Wow. J.R., this is fascinating. I have to ask, now we've introduced this, the word UFO. Do not leave us because we, we have uh, brought UFO into a Christian conversation. Uh, uh, UFOs. 
uh, call them celestial transportation vehicles. There's biblical evidence that the angels uh, use conveyances. In fact, tell us, Tom, about what you have written concerning angelic technology uh, and, and the use of technology in, in, at that level. Well, there is, a, there is a portion of, there was a book just before this called The Aramon Gate, which was co-written uh, with, my wife wrote it with me. And uh, there is a portion in that book, there's a place in that book where this question is asked, why would angels use flying saucers? I mean, right. why, and, and part of this goes, as you know, to our, our own Western culture. Uh, from the time we're tiny in Sunday school, we have the angels flying around without the use of any kind of, of equipment. They have built-in wings. Yeah, they, they have built. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but, but there is a character in the book who makes the case that if you look at creation, you note that everything God ever made had an, had an adaptability and an ability to use technology that he made them intelligent. Mm -hmm. So whether it's spiders weaving traps or other animals, the, the things that are invisible are known by the things that we see, the Bible tells us, so that the angels certainly would have had techno technological uh, knowledge and would have employed it. And they used it illegally, let's put it this way. In fact, the thrust of Enoch, uh, Genesis speaks about the, their descent to, into human form. Uh, Peter and Jude speak about it in the New Testament. Uh, when they encroached upon planet Earth, they did so illegally. Right. Now, the book of Enoch says there are only 200 of them that descended down onto Mount Hermon. I have a feeling that was just the advanced team, <laughs> you know, and then yes. they brought all the rest of them down. How true. Until this world was so corrupt, only Noah was still perfect in his generations, the King James Version puts it. I, I think that means genetically pure, and he and his family were the only ones God could save. I believe that. Yes. I have seen... Uh, the head of a beaver that was so large, and I'm talking about a fossil, so large that the beaver had to be 10 feet long. I've seen the head and horns of a buffalo that was 10 times larger than a modern buffalo skull. Uh, it was a skull with the horns. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Is it possible then that these angels are these fallen angels, the Nephilim or whatever, uh, were genetically manipulating these animals back before the flood, creating these giants? Yes. And that today the pure DNA, that which was saved aboard the ark and is uh, roaming around planet Earth today, is what God originally intended. Uh, so they're not so big. Correct. Um, and, and, and this forbidden technology, use that term might also uh, apply to the kinds of biotechnology because now we're starting to do again what only the gods of mythology or the fallen angels did. Yeah. And so will this open a Pandora's box? Will this take us back uh, the first time by flood, the next time by fire? And also, even when you follow through um, Nimrod, uh, Genesis 10, and Nimrod began to be a Giborim. And many scholars believe that the Gaborim are in the bloodline of the Watchers and the Nephilim, that they are the offspring of the Nephilim. What a fascinating statement. Nimrod began to be mm -hmm. a Gaborim. I can tell you that recently I... In other words, you can take an adult and change the DNA structure and through some kind of a virus or nanotechnology, uh, they can go throughout the body and change every single cell to be different from the original. And, and we have this record that Nimrod became a rebel. Mm -hmm. At some point, evidently, made decisions. Now, I recently, I began to be a diabetic. Mm -hmm. I was making poor choices about eating, working too many hours, not taking care of myself. And I was genetically predisposed to become a diabetic. It didn't mean I would, but it was in my bloodline. Mm. Now, think of Nimrod. He began making changes. And uh, he began to become a rebel, a mighty hunter. Um, and suddenly it says in Genesis 10, he began to be a Gaborim. The very next chapter, what does he do? He sets out to build a tower whose top would reach into Shemayim, the dwelling place of God. Whose top would reach into Shemayim, the dwelling place of God. I've, all, I've often wondered if when he began to become something different, 
were his eyes then suddenly opened to a plane of existence that the watchers would have been able to see, but had been closed off to humans. And suddenly he goes to a specific place and he starts building a tower. This too could be forbidden technology because maybe he then suddenly could see into the dwelling place of God. Maybe this was a rebellious act, but he suddenly had this interest in building. So you're, you're saying that, let's take for example dogs who can smell tumors. Right. Uh, they have a sense of smell that we don't have. Correct. Um, so it's possible that if altered genetically, we could smell tumors, or we could see beyond what our physical eyes see. We could see into the infrared spectrum, or we could see into the ultraviolet spectrum, or even wider than that, and see things that we currently don't know there, that, is, that are there. That's a brilliant observation, That's and you know the whole transhumanist movement now. Mm -hmm. Uh, they are in love with where biotechnology pretends to take us, mm. including opening new modes of perception by integrating our species with the animal kingdom. And Balaam's donkey could see the angel. Balaam couldn't. Animals may be able to perceive levels of, of reality around us, which for our own protection, God has not allowed us in this condition to see. And uh, so, so most certainly... Uh, we're looking at a technology now that could take us to a point. Mm. Um, and, if you, and if you think about this building a tower whose top would reach into heaven, think about how there is a record that upon tall locations heaven was attainable. When Jesus returns, his feet will touch the top of the Mount of Olives. Moses goes up upon the Mount of Sinai to communicate with God. The angels descend upon Horeb in the days of Jared, the watchers do. Uh, there, is a, there is a record, and it's seated deep in our, in our human psyche, too, mm -hmm. that we go up on high towers to reach God. Why is that there? Because there may be places where, if we could see those locations, mm -hmm. there are specific locations of entry. This could have been a great rebellious act, and it, and, and it takes on a whole new uh, prophetic angle when you start thinking about why we're in Iraq, Babylon now, mm -hmm. and set up a military presence where we believe was the ancient uh, location of the Tower of Babel. And we've just barely touched some of the subjects that are in this book, Nephilim Stargates, the year 2012 and the return of the Watchers. It's available for you from our ministry for $14.95 plus shipping and handling. Call the phone number at the bottom of your screen and order it with Visa, MasterCard, American Express, or Discover Card. We'll be glad to get it out to you right away. We have them in our warehouse, and we want you to get them. By the way, you're watching this television program. We invite you to go to our Internet site, prophecyinthenews.com, for another more lengthy interview with Tom Horn. So be sure and check out prophecyinthenews.com. Gary? Mm. Well, J.R., I'd like to raise uh, a, a kind of a, an associated topic. In Genesis 6-4, it says there were giants in the earth in those days and also after that, meaning after the flood, I think. And, and Jesus uh, made the remark once that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, uh, they were doing things in the days of Noah that were astounding, and that's a, a lot of what Nephilim Stargates is about. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom, the suggestion is that what happened in the days of Noah will come full force in the days just before the second coming of Christ. That's exactly what I believe. I mean, we're seeing, we're seeing the unfolding of biblical prophecy, mm -hmm. uh, sciences that can take us back t so that we can accomplish what was once forbidden and what ultimately led to the flood. Yeah. Now, you call them watchers here. Tell us the origin of the term watchers. Uh, watchers is a term that Enoch, uh, an extra-biblical prophet, used, but who is quoted in the New Testament, the book of Ju uh, Jude and Peter, both refer to his writings. And um, he tells the story of 200 very powerful angels mm -hmm. called watchers mm -hmm. who came down from heaven, uh, and these were the ones who set about to create the Nephilim. And what about 2012 here? What's that mean? Well, the, the year 2012, because in this book I also talk about some of the belief systems outside of the Christian circle that might uh, somehow harmonize. I, I wrote a book one time uh, called The Gods Who Walk Among Us, in which I offered a, a proposition that uh, I saw, as a pastor, I saw some of my uh, kids in church, and they were taking these comparative religion studies at school, and it was messing them up. 
mm -hmm. uh, because they were getting confused. You know, this religion's no different than that religion mm -hmm. because they're all saying much of the same thing. And I, I put forward a theory that there was an original revelation that came from God. And after the fall, it became splintered and dispersed among the nations. And, but people kept, kept those traditions and adapted them to their own histories. And they became oral histories. Now, I think this 2012 here is connected with the Mayan calendar. The Mayan calendar. Tell us about that. Right. Well, uh, yeah, December 21st, uh, at exactly 1111 in the year 2012, uh, the Mayan calendar will reach its zenith. It'll, it, that'll be the end of it. Uh, it's also the end of the Aztec uh, long calendar. And that, that is a time in which they believe that their great and terrible god, Quetzalcoatl, is going to, um, the skies are going to open or a stargate is going to open. And one theory, a rope ladder is going to descend and he'll come down. On, and another theory, however, a winged ship will appear with the return of Quetzalcoatl the ancient god of the Aztecs and Mayans. Cool, cool can to the Aztecs. Wow. J.R., one thing we must add uh, right here at the end is that, that, that Tom has done, I think, remarkable research on uh, the connection between ancient uh, Greek mythology mm -hmm. and the Bible, uh, showing how the Bible really reflects what, what the pagans were talking about at, as best they could in their histories. Amazing. Very good. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> well, it's an interesting book. It certainly is. Um, we have just about a minute or so. Uh, I think it's important for people to understand that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he came down to this earth 2,000 years ago and died on Calvary's cross to give us eternal life and to pay our sin debt. So this, there is a war going on between good and evil, God and the devil, Christ and Antichrist, and these uh, Nephilim are a part of the enemy. Jesus is head of the good guys. And I want you to know that you have a choice to make. It's either for Jesus or against him. And right now, uh, in your uh, normal human state, you were born in sin with Adam's sin upon you. And uh, so you don't have to make a decision if you want to go to that place where all the Nephilim are going to end up one of these days. But if you want to go to heaven with the rest of us, you need to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. So I encourage you to just pray a simple sinner's prayer. Ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins and to save you. He will, you know. He loves you. Just pray today, will you? And then write us and let us know that you've trusted Christ as your personal Savior. Uh, Gary... This, this book, of course, it will be continued as we continue this interview on our internet site, so be sure and uh, check uh, prophecyofthenews.com. This is J.R. Church. Until next time, keep looking up. Prophecy in the News is a viewer-supported ministry sponsored by our many friends across America and in your area. For your gift of $10, you can receive a special edition of our current program on audio tape, or for a gift of $20, we'll send you our programs on videotape. For either order, call the 800 number on your screen right now. Ancient biblical prophets wrote about the future. Today, theologians are poring over those scriptures with a firm belief that their prophecies are coming to pass. Journey now into the world of eschatology on Prophecy in the News with author and lecturer J.R. Church. We have the author of the book Nephilim Stargates, the year 2012 and the return of the Watchers. With us on today's program, his name is Tom Horn. And uh, Gary Stearman is here with me and him, and we're going to have a roundtable discussion on various aspects of this book that will, I think, fascinate you. Be sure to watch the entire program. Gary has the first question. Well, uh, Thomas Horn, author of Nephilim Stargates, has opened a number of biblical ideas to modern interpretation. We live in an era of technology. We live in an era when technology is changing on a daily level. 
And there is an intersection between technology and what the Bible predicts for the last days. And right in the opening pages of this book, and J.R., this is fascinating, uh, Tom Horn uh, mentions a, a mission to the moon, Apollo 11. And we have uh, recorded in, uh, in abbreviated form a conversation that took place between the astronauts of Apollo 11 and Houston. And Thomas Horn, welcome to Prophecy <laughs> in the News. And tell us about this conversation because this is fascinating. Uh, apparently our astronauts have seen what we would call UFOs while they were on the moon. Well, this, um, this reference that you're making is in the introduction to the book. It is, uh, it is a piece of transcript that has, in some quarters, been uh, criticized as not being um, substantiated. There are other people. Otto Binder gave sworn testimony that it was true. Uh, also, the former chief of uh, NASA Communications, Maurice uh, Chatelain, gave sworn testimony that it was common knowledge hmm. that the Apollo astronauts had actually saw and spoke um, uh, in their two-way transmission to NASA, which was picked up, which was blank blanked out by NASA, but was picked up by ham radio operators, uh, that there was an alien presence on the moon that was saw, there were ships that were there, that they were huge, that they were enormous. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I put this in the introduction, mm -hmm. uh, so have some other uh, researchers used this information, and. Um, so, as far as it being disputed by some, I think you look at the bigger picture and you realize that many presidents, Carter, uh, Reagan, others have talked about, um, and in fact Reagan, before the UN, even talked about his, uh, how he sometimes questioned, you know, uh, what, how the world would come together if suddenly facing an alien presence. Now, our audience uh, would be interested in, in hearing your take on who these uh, uh, UFOs would represent. Uh, usually the interpretation is that they come from other planets, uh, maybe from uh, Epsilon Eridani, <laughs> some exotic star in some other part of the galaxy, and, and they're here to help us out. Who, assuming that UFOs are real, and assuming they've been seen by our top people, are they from other galaxies, other planets, or maybe it's something else? Yeah, well, I've, it, you know, my study into this area led me to conclude that if this is technology, it's technology, nuts and bolts type technology that is something entirely different than the kind of fabricating of metals and the use of fossil fuels that we're accustomed to here yes. on Earth. Uh -huh. In addition to that, these things seem to behave sometimes more like living organisms. Uh, intelligent. Uh, they seem to be able to move in and out of our reality. Uh, maybe they are ten-dimensional. Maybe they are five-dimensional. Maybe they uh, have a known science that is something that is far surpassing. Uh, anything that at this point, at least in our development, we can even begin to comprehend. Mm -hmm. but, but, I, but I agree that even on the secular side, secular researchers, uh, the best of secular researchers have agreed that these things are behaving in a way that is comparable to angelology and demonology, that they seem to be a kind of intelligence that may even be at war with each other, certainly are using the human race Ooh. when possible. Not from another galaxy, but from another dimension. From another dimension, maybe. Now let me read what uh, you have written here on page one uh, from the transcript. Neil Armstrong reportedly mentioning, mentioned seeing, quote, strange lights, end quote, on the moon and said, we have company, before mission control switched off the live feed. And then it is said that this was picked up by ham radio operators. What's there? Mission control calling Apollo 11. Apollo 11 said, these babies are huge, sir, enormous. You wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you, there are other spacecraft out there lined up on the far side of the crater edge. They're on the moon watching us. <laughs> and, of course, there's more. You'll want to get this book. I, c I can tell you. Just call the phone number at the bottom of your screen and order it. It's 1495 plus shipping and handling. Call today. Order it from us with either Visa or MasterCard. American Express or Discover card and get this book. It's a fascinating read and uh, it'll help you to understand this 
angel, angel study in the Word of God. Who are these angels, both good and evil? Gary? Well, J.R., Satan is referred to as the prince of the power of the air. Uh, uh, we often see UFOs, uh, according to, I guess, thousands of witnesses flitting here and there through our atmospheric heavens. Sometimes they're witnessed as uh, a light that will appear and then disappear, winking out, going to another dimension. Uh, and you're making the point in this book, Nephilim Stargates, you're saying, in effect, that maybe they're coming in and out through gates of their own making, uh, what the sci-fi people call wormholes, or uh, who knows what it could be, but uh, the idea that angels may have technology is a fascinating idea. By the way, you know, remember the Book of Enoch? Uh, um, now, in the Zohar, the rabbis wrote that these angels were seen going through the sky, uh, much like the birds in the opening chapter of Genesis. Mm -hmm. this, this was written in the Zohar. Mm -hmm. But Enoch goes on to say that they didn't, and by the way, from this came the idea that angels had bird wings, you know, white, white uh, feathers and uh, mm -hmm. they could fly. Uh, which is not really aerodynamically designed for this atmosphere. That's true. But Enoch said they flew around in flying houses. Absolutely. And that fact. he entered these houses and looked up and down the hallways and saw what the floor was made of and the walls were made of. He Amazing. uses the term flying house, which I think is fascinating. Yes. Uh, Tom, this is fascinating to me because, and for for the sake of, of Christian, our Christian friends who are watching, in, uh, watching today and they're saying, uh, well, these fellows have gone completely around the bend. <laughs> we haven't gone around the bend as far as you may think because the Bible speaks volumes about angels traveling in vehicles. Elijah, for example, was picked up in a fiery chariot. And if we saw that today, probably we would say, there's a UFO picking up Elijah, would we not? Right. And even down through, down through history, you know, there are pieces of artwork in the 16th century, other periods of time, uh, where church fathers uh, would detail in paintings uh, what was seen by parts of their flock or, or out in the country that was seen by di the Fatima apparitions. I mean, different times and different places where people have recorded a phenomenon, and the language seems to be similar. It was circular in shape. It moved erratically. Um, my wife and I were driving years ago, and uh, I thought I saw a speck of light moving across the windshield. And the more I looked at it, the more I realized I was seeing something that I couldn't account for. It was circular. It was very high up in the sky. It was moving erratically. It was breaking every law that I knew, uh, you know, about how craft would be able to move through the sky. Stopped. My wife got out, and we watched it for a few minutes. And um, we didn't tell anybody that day. But the next day, uh, all across the Northwest, from Oregon to Seattle, um, people reported that they had saw something moving through the sky, and they called it a UFO. The, the Statesman Journal referred to it as UFO. So was it, was it angelic? Was it something that, I couldn't, that we couldn't explain? I, certainly we couldn't explain it, and neither could anybody else who saw it, but it wasn't known craft as we understand it. The reason why I also think that what's going on with these craft is because in U, what's called UFO flap areas, there's also phenomenon that occurs, alien abduction, uh, these things seem to have an interest that can be interpreted as malevolent, demonic, and secular researchers have said the same thing. Now, in 1 Samuel 28, when Saul talks to the witch of Endor, asks her to bring up Samuel, you say in your book that she saw gods ascending out of the earth. Tell us mm -hmm. about that. Well, this is what she said. And she was, uh, the, the Hebrew uh, phrase for her was a maiden of the Ab. The ob is, ob is a word that's used throughout uh, both Hebrew and also uh, even ancient Canaanite religions to describe the, the spirits of humans or gods or other uh, super intelligences. It goes back to ancestral worship where our ancestors were deified by non-Hebrew faiths uh, and they practiced communicating with them. When she saw this, it startled her. Here was a woman who was familiar with doing this. She was accustomed to doing this. This shook her up. This was something unusual. But 
so she could see with her eyes what normal people could not see, and she saw uh, beings coming up out of the ground. Right. Like walking through a solid wall. And that's one part of the, what I do in this book, is I talk about uh, how, according to Scripture, there are intelligent spirits that are bound in certain places, sometimes in the earth, sometimes they're in the sky, sometimes they're in the sea. Um, and that under unusual or extraordinary circumstances, sometimes they can move from those points of location, as in the case of the Witch of Endor, uh, the, or at least communicate, especially when they are sought out, especially when we go looking for them. Uh, there's another place in the book where we talk about the Alamantra working and some of the other uh, intentional efforts to open a dimensional vortex through which you could bring an intelligence. Yes, you mention in your book here, a bizarre story of Aleister Crowley back in 1918. Tell us about that. Yeah, and back in 1918, he was the head of, the, I think it was called the Ordo Templis Orientis, uh, a very um, esoteric uh, branch off of, of masonry and some other, um, you know, illuminated forms of religion. And uh, he, was, he had also been involved in British intelligence, a smart guy, but he became very involved in the occult. And he had an interest in performing um, an incantation that would open a dimensional vortex. He called it the Alamantra working. And he went through a whole series of uh, spells and workings. And at one point, he claimed that he was successful, that a rift opened and that a being came through it, which he called Lam, L-A-M. And even though this was approximately 100 years ago, the image that he drew of Lam is startlingly similar to the alien greys. Uh, that people have drawn uh, for centuries since then. Amazing. That is fascinating. In, in fact, uh, this opens up all kinds of thoughts and questions. Uh, you're talking about a Stargate being a rift or a door in time space. And you're saying that angels uh, travel to and fro through these rifts or doors, and that would include fallen angels, the fallen angels the Bible talks about. And that's essentially the thrust of, of your book. The, the fact that they did it, the reasons why they did it, and what they did to humanity that, that caused, ultimately caused the Great Flood. That's kind of the thrust of your book. Isn't yeah, it? that's exactly right. Okay. How about that? Well, J.R. Yeah. Some 30 years later, yeah. after this Aleister Crowley event, the man who built the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and his friend L. Ron Hubbard opened another gate. That's right. They? Tell us well, they were that. devotees. They were actually students of Aleister Crowley's, Jack Parson and uh, uh, L. Ron Hubbard, and uh, who started, of course, Scientology. And um, they wanted to go back and repeat this effort, but they didn't want to bring Lamb through. They wanted to bring through um, the, the whore of Babylon. They wanted to bring through this, this uh, anti-feminine, if you will, the ultimate, and have it incarnated within a woman. In fact, if you go and read the rituals that they performed, I mean, it was very much sex, sexual magic. They had a woman who was willing to be the host mm -hmm. to bring through the whore of Babylon. And what I think is ironic is they also claimed to have some success. In fact, um, uh, uh, Jack Parsons wrote about how on the third day of the performing of this uh, effort that a light came through a rift in space in front of him, something hit him and knocked his book out of his hands. Mm -hmm. So they were definitely dealing with uh, occultic powers if, if their story is to be believed. But that was accomplished in 1947, the same year that Kenneth Arnold was flying his airplane across the Northwest and suddenly saw what has now become the classic definitions of the startings of the whole UFO phenomenon. And then flying came Roswell. Saucers. Roswell the same So you're year. saying that these two guys may have opened the rift and let these other UFOs through? Uh, they, they, they may have, uh, but at a minimum, they were certainly trying to do something. And of course, Parsons went on to, uh, to found the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, very much had an interest in propulsions and technology. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and but, L. Ron Hubbard went on to uh, start the Church of Scientology. Right. And, of course, if you understand the Church of Scientology, there's a very powerful alien force that is involved in our uh, evolution. Mm. Uh, That's amazing. Well, you say here, the whore of Babylon walks the earth today. They let her through. 
Well, that's what they claim. <laughs> that's what they claim. It's a fascinating oh, book. It hey, is. get it. You need to read it. It's called Nephilim Stargates, the year 2012 and the return of the Watchers. It's available through this ministry for 14.95 plus shipping and handling. Call the phone number at the bottom of your screen and order it with your Visa, MasterCard, American Express, or Discover card, or you can buy it online at prophecyinthenews.com. Do it today. Gary? Well, JR, I'm looking at Tom's book, page 135. There's a question here in large type. It says, will modern biotechnology play a role in the return of the Nephilim? Now, the Nephilim being the fallen ones who populated the earth in the days of Noah. And Jesus said the days of Noah would return in some form. It would be like that just prior to the second coming. And well, he said they were marrying and giving in marriage. Yes. That's what these Nephilim did when they <laughs> took daughters of men. Absolutely. Now, the question is, modern biotechnology, it kind of scares me a little bit. To, to be honest, when I read about biotech and transgenics and so forth. Speak about that a little bit, Tom. Well, it's, it's a phenomenon. I mean, uh, uh, Leon Cass, the former chair for the President's Council on Bioethics, uh, immediately after serving his uh, tenure on that board, wrote a book in which he said that we are right now standing at the gateway uh, to, uh, for redefining what it means to be an animal, what it means to be a human, mm. what it means to be a superhuman, and then he went on to say what it means to become a god. You might remember also following um, the Council on Bioethics report that President Bush stood up during one of his uh, 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 speeches and, and called for legislation to outlaw the creation of human-animal chimeras. That wasn't so long ago. It's already been approved in Australia. It's improved in Great Britain. Wow. They, they're, they're approving patents right now for creatures who do not have to be destroyed at 14 days. And so it seems like our, you know, we're being warmed up now for what is inevitable, and that is the whole transhumanist movement. And by the way, the transhumanists are not fringe. I've been on their shows. I've debated Dr. James Hughes, who is, uh, who is one of the primary figures in the transhumanist movement. He's a, he's a college professor. Um, he is a bioethicist that teaches at Trinity College in Hartford, mm -hmm. Connecticut. Um, his, his buddy, Nick Bostrom, actually earned his uh, prestigious uh, steed at Oxford University. Mm -hmm by doing his thesis on transhumanism. They're very excited about it. And they talk openly about opening these new modes of perception, these new human modalities through merging our species with animal species. The, the, this thing is out of the box. The train is in motion. I don't see that there's any way we're going to stop it. And to me, it's very prophetic. Mm. So, and that's part, of course, of the motivation for writing this book. Well, let me throw another quick question at you. Uh, there's something else that's happening today, and back to UFOs again, UFO abductions. And some people say that UFO abductions uh, involve transgenics, that is, experimentations on abducted human beings, and the people doing the abducting would be the people you're talking about, the Nephilim, perhaps. Well, perhaps, uh, or something related to them. Fallen angels working in league with maybe some other um, plan that we don't understand. John Keel wrote about that. Dr. Mack, in his interviews with abductees, wrote extensively about how um, he found similarities in these stories about how these beings seem to come through a rift, if you will. Uh, and they're interested in collecting and harvesting human matter, also animal matter. And Valle, uh, you know, he, he um, uh, hypothesized that this was for the purpose of creating a body. Uh, into which these things could extend themselves into wow. our material reality and even that there might be those that walk among us right now mm. pretending to be entirely human but pretty soon we're going to have humans through biotechnology who are becoming transhumans and the ultimate goal is post-humanity something, something that they see as ultimately our evolution now if, I'm sorry, if Jesus it does not come back soon all this can lead us down a very dismal path for humanity. That's uh, correct. We're already seeing in genetically modified crops that the, uh, that the mixing of, of living organisms in ways that neither evolution, if you buy that, mm -hmm. or creation, if you're a believer, neither one of those allowed for. And we're already finding out, I mean, uh, rats that were, that were being studied by Arpad Puste and others, 
Um, uh, it, when given the opportunity to eat genetically modified potatoes or non-genetically modified potatoes, the rats would go directly to the non-genetically modified potatoes. They only eat the other ones if they were being starved. We, we can't even understand at what intelligence level they could understand the difference between genetically modified and non-genetically modified. When they were forced to eat the genetically modified crops, their offspring died at half-life. There are other genetically modified crop fields that have been planted that downwind have caused people to begin developing respiratory problems. We're simply, but we're not waiting. We're not waiting. The FDA has already approved uh, cloned meats, much of the genetically modified crops. Giant corporations are driving this because there's billions of dollars to be made in this industry. Pandora's box. Yeah. And Tom, uh, JR and I are on the same wavelength. I was going to ask a similar question to the one you asked, namely, uh, from a prophetic perspective, you've studied these things. How close must the, the coming of Christ be? Well, this is, you know, partly the reason I chose to put the year 2012, even though it's related to Mayan and, <laughs> and Aztec, yeah. but is to emphasize to the popular culture because I don't want just to preach to the choir. I want people at large to buy this book and read it so that they can get the sense that there is a clock that is ticking down and that, cult that it, biblically it's true but even cultures outside of the Bible understand that we're living at a period of time, at an accelerated time where things are occurring now and isn't it astonishing, isn't this astonishing that at a time when biotech can now repeat a science that was only maybe performed once before by the watchers who brought the world to, uh, who caused the world to ultimately wind up at the flood um, that we have invaded Iraq and, I and potentially will Iran mm -hmm. at a time when biotech is capable of doing what the watchers did we went into the home of the Tower of Babel which is related to Nimrod and in the, and in the first show that we did we also connected those dots there that this may be the only place on the face of the earth where the Bible actually identified a location of a stargate we went there we're not exactly sure what our interest is in being there but Isaiah the prophet uh, says this concerning, um, this is by the way from the Greek Septuagint, so I hope it's okay to quote from that. Mm -hmm. uh, Isaiah 13, 1 through 3 says, The vision which Isaiah, son of Amos, saw against Babylon, mm -hmm. Iraq, or the location of Iraq, lift up a standard on the mountain of the plain, exalt the voice of them, beckon with the hand. Now listen to what he says. Open the gates, ye ruler. I give command, and I bring them. Giants are coming to fulfill my wrath. Now, this is a prophecy about the end time. Babylon is going to be destroyed, and at a time when it's being destroyed, God orders, it's almost like when he sends the great angels down, you know, in the book of Revelation to, mm -hmm. to have a key to a pit. He orders uh, somebody, a ruler, to open a gateway through which, this literally says the Gaborim in the Hebrew, the, he brings back the Gaborim to fulfill his wrath at the end of times. And it's at a time when Iraq is, uh, uh, Babylon is being invaded and destroyed. So on every level, when you look at what's transpiring in the Middle East, when you look at what's transpiring in, in science, when you look at much of the indication that we are probably moving toward a time of official disclosure of alien technology, and even some of the world's greatest religious organizations are preparing their people by writing theological essays and, and books that this will not challenge our orthodoxy, that the church is going to be okay. Well, how much of a coincidence can it be that our uh, Middle East headquarters is in Baghdad, which is like 60 miles north of old Babylon? Right. A, rather a, an interesting coincidence. Well, in the New York Times ran an article recently uh, in which they were discussing how that the, U the U.S. government and the Baghdad government and the United Nations are entertaining an idea to turn Babylon, ancient Babylon, into an international cultural center, to invest billions of dollars into it, to turn it into an international cultural center, to essentially rebuild it. So. Uh, in terms of prophecy, it, 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 no matter which direction you look at this, uh, you could interpret the bits and pieces in different ways, but we're living in various prophetic times. And you know, when John wrote that a star fell from heaven and opened a bottomless pit, and out of it came locusts to, uh, to go and, um, and torture men for five months, uh, we, we and earlier... Uh, generations could not understand or comprehend what he was talking about. But this idea of gates, this idea of the watchers coming back, um, 
and uh, plaguing the earth during the tribulation period, it, it makes a lot of sense. Well, JR, I mean, you know, I have to just quickly react. One of the creatures that comes up uh, is called Apollyon. Mm -hmm. You know, that would be the ancient uh, god worshipped by the Greeks. That's right, not? Apollo. Apollo. That's exactly right. And there are records that, he, that directly say Apollo is Apollyon uh, in ancient records. And not all, uh, and these outside of the scripture that identify him as such. And notice that those beings are transgenics. They're, they're mutated, they're mixtures of various kinds of animals. Mm -hmm. And when you follow Isaiah's prophecy all the way through to the end uh, of, that, of that chapter, he talks about how Babylon will be occupied by satires, mythological creatures and monsters and transgenics. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I want you to get this book. Uh, you can call today and uh, get this book from us. We've got it in the warehouse ready to send it out to you. It's fourteen ninety-five plus shipping and handling. Call the phone number at the bottom of your screen and get it today. Nephilim Stargates, the year 2012 and the return of the Watchers by Tom Horn. Get it today, will you? Or you can buy it online at prophecyinthenews.com. So look it up, order it today. We'll get it right out to you. You know, Gary, we've got just less than a minute. Yes. Um, it is important in the discussion of, this, of these negative uh, angels to let people know that there are some positive angels out there. And Jesus, who is the Son of God, who loves us, can you imagine God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. That means that this world doesn't have to perish. God has a plan of salvation, a way by which you can receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. You can be born into the family of God. I would urge you right now to just bow your head and tell the Lord you know you're a sinner and you're sorry. Ask him to forgive you and save you. He will, you know. He loves you. This is J.R. Church and our guest today saying, keep looking up. Prophecy in the News is a viewer-supported ministry sponsored by our many friends across America and in your area. For your gift of $10, you can receive a special edition of our current program on audio tape, or for a gift of $20, we'll send you our programs on videotape. For either order, call the 800 number on your screen right now.